Amen. And welcome back to our continuing Bible study series on the life lessons that we can learn from the life of Joseph. Now, last Sunday morning, from the life of Joseph in Genesis chapter 40, we learned four biblical principles for when your life feels like a prison. It is completely natural for our lives to feel like prison sometimes. We all experience problems in our lives that just do not seem to go away. And no matter what we do, we just cannot seem to fix them. Work, finance, relationship, health, whatever. Your problems in your life, when your life feels like a prison, whatever your problems are in your life, I missed the word there, um, whenever your life feels like a prison, just remember these four biblical principles to live. Never give up. Keep on keeping on, meaning whatever you are supposed to be doing, keep doing it. God didn't call us to quit while waiting on problems. He called us to, to serve faithfully regardless. And then, of course, remain faithful to God's holy word and trust God's timing. And that's the hardest part, I think, for everybody. We, we're so used to everything being instant. We even got instant milk and instant orange juice and whatever. Um, we want everything right now. Well, trust God's timing. It's always better than our own, I can guarantee you that. But this Sunday morning, we are continuing our continuing Bible study series on the life lessons that we can learn from the life of Joseph in Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 through 57. Now, we do not know exactly how long Joseph was kept in prison, but according to Genesis chapter 41 and verse 1, we do know that Joseph was in prison for two years after he interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh. Uh, the chief butler and baker. For two long years in prison, Joseph waited on God. We don't see anything in there about him whining and complaining or fighting. We, we just know that it was two years. Why do you think that is? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, Peter teaches us that, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's why we should be faithful in times of trials or tribulations. Because not is it just you know proving our faith, but it's glory to God. Joseph's time in prison was not pleasant. According to Psalm chapter 105, verses 17 through 23, it tells us a little bit about Joseph's imprisonment, release, and rise to power. But note what Psalm 105, verse 18 tells us about his situation. Whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron. So even though he might have been the, the assistant warden to the prison, he was still a prisoner. It says here he was in chains that hurt his feet. Of course, you got the big ball and chain concept. If you think of that, that would be painful. We like to think that he was living in the lap of luxury. He wasn't really living in the lap of luxury. He was still a prisoner regardless. He was unable to go or do as he wanted to do. I'm sure he would have preferred to have been home with his family, but he was a prisoner. But after two long years, something was about to change. God gave Pharaoh two dreams. Now, in the first dream, Pharaoh was standing on the bank of the river. And in Genesis chapter 41, verses 2 through 4, God's holy word declares, And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. Then in Genesis chapter 41, of verses 5 through 7, And Pharaoh slept and dreamt the second time, and behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and the Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. 
And in verse 8, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So Pharaoh awoke up troubled by his dreams and called all of his so-called wise men um, to interpret his dreams. Surprisingly, none of Pharaoh's so-called wise men were able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. If you remember from last week, I, I mentioned how in ancient uh, Egypt, they actually thought that <coughs> dream interpretation was a science, and they had classes to teach people how to be professional dream interpreters. None of these at the highest level in Egypt could interpret this dream. I find it not necessarily hard to believe because God said it, so I believe it, but it's unfathomable that all these so-called wise men were unable to interpret the dream, especially when you consider how full of some, uh, some symbolism, uh, the word will come out, symbolism these dreams were. I mean, it, it, you look at it, and most of us could probably figure out what it meant without too much difficulty. Nonetheless, they, they tried, but none were able to interpret the dream to Pharaoh's satisfaction. So whatever they came up with, we don't know, but um, it just didn't work. So God filled the mind of Pharaoh with dreams, yet at the same time, God emptied the minds of Pharaoh's so-called wise men, removing any reasonable interpretation of his dreams. God made sure that Pharaoh would know through the ineptus of his own so-called wise men that God was still on the throne and still in control. So when he could not find anyone to interpret his dreams, his butler suddenly had a moment of clarity and remembered, guess who? That's right, Joseph. So the butler told Pharaoh about Joseph and his ability to interpret dreams. So in Genesis 41, verses 9 through 13, God's holy word declares, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream, and one night I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was, me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Why did all this happen? By the way, why is you know, this guy suddenly remembering and telling us? Well, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1 answers this question for us. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithsoever he will. So remember, God is in control. As I said before at the beginning of this study of the life of Joseph, if you want to summarize the life of Joseph in, in one little phrase, it's God is in control. He has these dreams no one can interpret. And finally, after two years in prison, the butler remembers him and tells him this story, tells to Pharaoh the story. Why? Because God is in control. Even if we cannot see or understand everything going on in our lives, we can know that God is still in control. And in this chapter of Joseph's life, we learn two biblical principles we must live if we are to live our own rags-to-riches life. Now, I'll say this right now. One of the greatest rags-to-riches stories. Now, everyone loves a good rags-to-riches story. Some poor kid, whatever, and now is rich and all this. People like that type of story. You make a movie about it, and it sells millions. This is the greatest rags to riches story ever told. It cannot get more grander than this. I mean, we went from a shepherd boy to a slave to a prisoner to second in command of Egypt. This is a pretty amazing rags to riches story. And if you want God to be able to do the same thing in your life, and I'm not talking about making you wealthy or anything, but um, taking your life and using it for his glory then we must learn to plan and ban. First of all, you must plan to live God's purpose for your life. In Genesis chapter 41, verses 14 through 36, we're going to see that the butler recounted the story of how Joseph correctly interpreted his dream as well as the baker's dream. He shared the story to suggest that Joseph may be able to interpret Pharaoh's dream as well. Now, if his suggestion proved helpful, 
he would likely gain favor with Pharaoh. And he already had faith in this guy because he'd already you know, interpreted his own dream. So he thinks it's going to work. So he's going to be able to get a higher position or something, maybe get a pay raise. I don't know. But Pharaoh was desperate and probably trusted his butler quite a bit since he's the one who is handing him his drinks and all. Uh, you better trust the guy who's feeding and, and, and giving you your drinks. But since no one else could interpret the dreams, in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 14, we read that then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. <coughs> By the way, in old covenant times, the Egyptians were generally the only clean shaven people. Everybody else wore beards, especially the Hebrews. But the Hebrew word here used for shaved can equally refer to shaving his head or at least very close cropping it, which is, of course, another distinctive Egyptian practice. Joseph was not here trying to hide his Hebrew roots, but he knew how important this meeting was, so he dressed for the occasion, kind of like we would do for a job interview. He's going before the, the king uh, or pharaoh of Egypt, who is considered by the, the locals as being a god. So he needs to be cleaned up and presentable. So he gets himself cleaned up. He shaves, probably his head as well. And then he puts on some clean clothes. <coughs> That's always a good thing to do. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. So here... Pharaoh doesn't tell him anything like no one else has been able to interpret it um, and this butler told me that you can do it. He's kind of generic in this. You know, none that can interpret it and I heard say of you, that you can do it. Well, we know who told him that he could do it. But anyway, I love Joseph's response to Pharaoh. It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Joseph made it clear that the one true God would provide him the ability to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. This is an example of one of my life verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Not the glory of self, but to the glory of God. But remember that according to ancient Egyptian culture, the Pharaoh was worshipped as their God. So that was a very bold statement for Joseph to make to Pharaoh's face. The God will interpret your dream for you. I like that. He's a bold man. He's not being disrespectful, but he is bold in his faith. <coughs> and yet we are usually scared to share, you know, even tell people we're Christians, much less tell people about Christ. But I'm here reminded of a young lady. I do not recall when or where I met her, but she was traveling with a ladies' quartet, probably from a Christian college. And after they were all done with their singing, I remember I, I complimented the group and thanked each of them for coming out and singing. And I can still remember their reply. Uh, it, it, they did not thank me. They didn't say, oh, thank you for enjoying our music. None of them said that. Rather, they replied quite simply with, praise God. Because they weren't here singing for their own glory. They were doing whatsoever they do all to the glory of God. And that's a lesson that I, I've tried to live myself um, but we should all learn to live such humility as that. What a blessing. Then in Genesis chapter 41, verses 17 through 24, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat-fleshed and well-favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean flesh, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. So I awoke, and I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up and on, in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. So I find it amusing to read how Pharaoh described his dreams compared with how God described them. In verse 3, the cows were ill-favored and lean-fleshed. 
But according to Pharaoh in verse 19, the cows were poor and very ill-favored and lean flesh such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And then Pharaoh added this additional detail in verse 21, and when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. And re regarding the, the corn, in verse 6, God said that there are seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind. But the Pharaoh, in verse 23, described it as seven ears withered, thin, and blasted with the east wind. Pharaoh ignored the positives, the, the fat and, and the healthy, um, ignored the positives while exaggerating the negatives because he was stressed and not thinking clearly. Unfortunately, we tend to do the exact same thing in our own lives. <coughs> Whenever we are going through a storm in our life, we will forget all of God's promises, provisions, and protections in our life and only focus on our fears, our problems. We've got so much good that God has done for us, but as soon as something goes wrong, we forget that and then complain about whatever bad is going on. It's our human nature, if you will. But I love Christ Jesus' answer to this in Mark chapter 5, verse 36. Be not afraid, only believe. This is one of my other life verses. This is where Christ Jesus promised Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue, that his dead daughter was not dead, but only sleepeth. A lesson all of us need to live more of and live in our lives is that we should not be afraid. We should just believe. We find it very hard to do that. I, I get that. I find it hard to do that sometimes. We can't stop thinking about what the problem is, and we allow that to, to rob us of our joy. But if we will just trust in God, we trust Him with our salvation, and we can't trust Him with our life. I don't, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Be not afraid, only believe. But I also find it interesting how God repeated the dream descriptions a second time. Keep in mind that papyrus paper probably offered limited space on the scrolls for extra stuff. But if God took the time to repeat the description of the dreams for us, then obviously God wanted us to see this. When God repeats himself, we need to be paying attention. And God repeated this description a second time for us. And then in verses 25 through 32, Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. <coughs> and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. <coughs> me. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Notice how Joseph used only one verse to describe the seven years of plenty, but two verses to describe the seven years of famine. Here Joseph emphasized the famine to make sure Pharaoh understood the importance of that plenty. So after Joseph explained to Pharaoh that Egypt would experience seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, he also told Pharaoh the reason he had two dreams with the same meaning was that God had decreed these events and that they would happen soon. Again, when God repeats himself, you better be paying attention. Joseph then provided Pharaoh with a solution in verses 33 33 through 36, now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities 
and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. This solution was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants as well. So Pharaoh sought out the wisest man in the land and put him in charge of a nationwide program of storing 20% of the food produced during the seven good years. That plan would provide enough food for all of Egypt during the seven years of famine. Now many verses in the book of Proverbs teach us that planning ahead is a part of being wise. For example, Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6 we are commanded to go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. And according to ver, uh, verses 7 and 8, what are we to learn from the ant? Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. So we're perfect example of what Joseph is telling uh, Pharaoh to do. Gather up in the good so you'll have it in the times of lean. Like ants, we should plan for the future in our finances, careers, retirement, whatever. We should also plan our schedule so that we can spend time with our families and with God. But much more importantly, we must learn to plan for God's purpose for our life. Once you have determined what that is, you should be doing everything you can towards that, which includes planning for it. All of Joseph's life, <clears throat> was preparation for this moment and the next 14 years. Had Joseph not remained faithful to God during those trying times of testing and tribulation, God would not have been able to use him according to his plan at this moment in time. So to live your own rags to riches life, plan to live God's purpose for your life and ban the pain of the past. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 41, verses 37 through 57. Pharaoh was so impressed with Joseph um, and his plan that in Genesis 41, verses 39 through 41, Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, notice, for as much as God hath showed thee all of this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. One very important note here is how Pharaoh, the false god of Egypt, declared that God had showed thee all this. But it is apparent that Pharaoh was impressed with Joseph because he was so discreet and wise as well. <coughs> And the word discreet here is like understanding, knowledgeable. Um, Donald Gray Barnhouse noted that the secret of power is character. But the secret of character is God. And that's Joseph right here. Again, a lesson we would well to learn and live in our own lives. You want power in your life? Live a life of character. How do you live a life of character? Through the power of God, God's Holy Word, God's Holy Spirit in your life. Then Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand. This ring was used to make an impression in soft clay or wax of Pharaoh's seal on official documents. It gave Joseph the power and authority of Pharaoh. Back in those times as well, is if you think about the Godfather or the Pope, you know, you're, if you're in the presence, you're supposed to kiss that ring. Ain't going to happen. I don't care who they are. Ain't going to happen. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, this was a pretty important piece of jewelry. If not, it shows who you are and, and your authority. But when his own brothers planned to murder him, they stole Joseph's infamous coat of many colors from him. When Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph, causing him to be cast into prison, she stole his coat from him. Every time that Joseph faced adversity, his garments were stolen away from him. But now Pharaoh not only gives Joseph a new garment, but he gave Joseph a royal garment. Kind of sounds an awful lot like our new life in Christ Jesus. Amen. But additionally... Pharaoh had Joseph ride in his second chariot so people would know his position and power. Finally, Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath paneah and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. By the way, zaphnath paneah 
is a Coptic name and means the revealer of secret things. Rather well-fitting name, I'd say, but it is important <coughs> to note that Potiphar and Potiphera were not related, um, not at all. It's just one is the uh, servant of a fake goddess and the other is the, uh, if you will, the warden of a prison, not related. But anyway, my marrying into the priestly family, which had authority and influence, it further enhanced Joseph's power. So Joseph is not just second in command um, politically. <coughs> he now has the power of the fake church <coughs> behind his name as well. Joseph was at that time 30 years old. So 13 years had passed since his brothers had sold him into slavery. God used those years of adversity to teach and test Joseph, preparing him to live God's purpose for his life. <coughs> adversity accelerates our spiritual growth, and Joseph's problems were not a uh, coincidental chain of accidents generated by bad luck. The pit, Potiphar's wife, and the prison were all part of God's plan for preparing Joseph to live God's purpose for his life. Why did God allow Joseph to become a slave and a prisoner before elevating him to become the second most powerful man in the world? <coughs> Consider how Christ Jesus himself answered that question in Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Joseph was faithful as a slave and a prisoner, so no doubt he would be faithful as ruler over all the land of Egypt. But in verse seven, uh, 47, and in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. So now we, we have the, the plenty years. And Joseph gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was round about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering for it was without number. Note how Joseph wisely stored the grain in various cities throughout Egypt so that it would be accessible to everyone in the land when needed. And God provided plenty. And yet we fear we may not have enough. Friends, God is faithful. Just as faithful as it was back then, he is still faithful today. Before the years of famine arrived, though, Joseph had two sons to whom he gives Hebrew names, revealing his faith in Jehovah uh, God to keep his promises. And under Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. Note what Joseph named his firstborn son. In Genesis 41, uh, verse 51, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. <coughs> Joseph named his firstborn son Manasseh, which means to forget. Joseph chose this name because of God's blessings in his life. Joseph was able to forget the wrongs he had suffered and the misery of being separated from his family. Does this mean that Joseph had forgotten the pit, Potiphar's wife, or the prison? Did Joseph forget being betrayed, the, the false accusations, the humiliation, or the loneliness? Absolutely not. Joseph could never forget all of those things, but he chose to forget the pain and refused to harbor any bitterness or hatred in his heart towards anyone. He can't forget, but he can still forgive. Joseph was able to do this because he knew two things. First, you cannot change the past. What is done is done. Leave it behind you like the dust of the earth, just like Christ Jesus commanded his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Leave it behind you. That dust is this dust of the earth. Forget about it. It doesn't stay with you. Second, it is God's place to avenge. Joseph did not have God's holy word perfectly perver uh, preserved for him in his own language like we do at God's authorized Bible, you know, the Geneva Bible. Uh, so he could not have read this verse, uh, but Joseph knew God's heart. He also knew God's words found in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. 
We must remember it is impossible to enjoy our present blessings if we are unwilling to forget the pain of our past problems. And then in verse 52, God says, In the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be faithful in the land of my affliction. So Joseph named his second son Ephraim, which simply means doubly fruitful. Joseph knew that no one can be fruitful until they are willing to forgive. Forgive first, and then God can bless your life. You cannot be happy in the present, no matter what your blessings, unless you are willing to forget past pain and forgive those responsible. <coughs> and the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according to... Uh, as Joseph had said, and the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all lands. God was setting the stage <coughs> for the next chapter of Joseph's life. Joseph teaches us that the truth, uh, getting the most out of life, to be able to go from rags to riches comes from a willingness to forgive. Joseph is a wonderful example of the promise found in Psalm 106, verse 3. Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Joseph did what was righteous when he willingly forgot the pain of his past, <coughs> allowing God to be able to use him. Friends, if we are to effectively live God's purpose for our lives, then we must absolutely learn to plan and ban. We must plan to live God's purpose for our life and ban the pain of our past. Learn to forgive and let live. After all, did God not forgive you of all your sins against him? I have a sneaky suspicion he did. And so living your own rags to riches life requires that we plan and ban. And again, when I'm talking about the riches, I'm not talking about earthly wealth. I'm talking about God's blessings. But living your own rags to riches life also requires that we return right back here uh, next Sunday morning, as we continue our continuing Bible study series on the life lessons that we can learn from the life of Joseph in Joseph.